Today we're going to be in Matthew uh, 26. I want to say welcome to all of you who joined online. Uh, this was the funnest drive to church I've ever had. This morning about 5.30, there was an, I was, you know, on the road before skiers even, so it was, it was fun. But the best part was, um, on Saturday night, I go to bed earlier than normal, and my wife stays up later than normal because she can watch these wives, midwives things that she watches on Netflix, and she can binge watch because I'm not there. And it's kind of a girl thing. And so uh, I wake up this morning and open the garage door and, and the whole driveway's uh, shoveled for me. I even got up a little earlier to make that happen. I'm thinking, wow, I'm married, I'm married up for sure. So um, actually, I want to I wanna open with a story about marriage. Um, when I was maybe still in seminary or a very young pastor, a couple in the 18, 19 range um, were madly in love. Their names were Derek and Marnie. And uh, they, they wanted me to do their wedding the worst way, and I did. And, and so they got married, and I, I just dropped by their house, I don't know, a week or so afterwards. And, and, and they, there are a lot of public displays of affection here. And, and I've never seen a couple so in love. You know, I've done several weddings. And I mean, they were so demonstrative. And I walked into their apartment and in the living room, huge, like eight feet by six feet was this sign, I love Marnie, and hugs and kisses and everything. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is a bit much for me. But... <laughs> Um, I was impressed. I'm like, wow, these, these young people, you know, are smitten with, with each other. A year later, they were divorced. And I'm like, what is going on? And, and of course, I'm young in ministry, and, and um, I realize it takes more than love for a healthy marriage. It takes a little thing called commitment. Something that neither of them had grown up with. They didn't know what a, what a healthy family looked like, a healthy marriage looked like. Uh, they, didn't, they hadn't learned what it means to be committed to being unselfish or a servant or deference to your, your partner. I mean, all the things that make a, a marriage a long-term relationship, it seemed they missed that class. And it was, it was really sad for me. But it was an important lesson as well, which is why I'm telling you this. Because many people feel about Jesus like this couple felt for their spouse. But without commitment, you don't have much of a chance to grow past a certain place in your life with Jesus. Commitment is something that God expects. Jesus said, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. In other words, you'll be committed to me. You'll, that commitment will be between Sundays. You know, some people have this version of Christianity. They go to church, they get all pumped up, and then they try to make it through the end of the week, and then they go to church, they get pumped up, and then they have to do real life. And, and commitment is that which is an, a daily routine, a practice, a habit. Habits like prayer. Habits like opening up the Bible and and. Uh, self-learning, so to speak, and on and on and on, and all the things that the Bible says that we should be doing. And for some reason, this has sort of been lost, this idea of a spiritual work ethic. And so um, that's why we have this right in the middle. If you look at your, your bulletin at the very top, it says committed. But on two, two steps before that, everyone starts with consumer. Everyone starts with uh, how does this affect me? How is this going to help me? And the focus is on me. And then we say, well, I need to connect with other people. And so we talked about that last week, connecting with other people, people who are also in love with Jesus and want to grow. And so we surround ourselves, not completely, not 100%, but we all, I suggested that all of us need a good friend who loves Jesus, who can help to... to um, walk with us 
in this journey. We all need a group of people, like a small group or a ministry team, where we encourage one another and we use each, you know, our, our gifts and everyone uses their particular gifts and they fit together and we're part of this team. That's how God designed it. And without that, we'll only grow to a certain point. But connection is not the end in itself. Let me say that again because there are many, many Christians today that think once I have a, a few Christian friends that can encourage me, that's the end of it. No, that's the beginning of it. Okay, so, so we, we go from consumer to connected to this idea of commitment. Now the last two steps, we'll talk about compelled next week, is something God does in us. So obviously if we're compelled, it's not self-driven, it's God-driven. We're compelled and we'll talk about what that is. And then the last one, we sense God has called us. God has called us. And uh, that's probably, the, in my opinion, the highest level of sacrifice when we totally um, give ourselves to whatever it is that God, we believe God's purpose for our life is. Not my purpose for my life, God's purpose. And so we'll get to that. That's one of my favorites in these five steps. Well, what does commitment mean? Well, I put a definition here uh, to the words devote or commit, to entirely give or apply oneself to a particular activity, pursuit, cause, or person. In our case, it's the person of Jesus. Commitment is to Jesus. Commitment is to serve Jesus. Commitment is to be about whatever he uh, tells us uh, it needs to be about, what we need to be about. And we're going to look at Matthew 26 this morning, the first book in the New Testament. If you're not already there, I know when you're watching online, when I watch online, I'm really tempted just to kind of put uh, the easy chair back. But I'd like you to uh, grab your Bible and go to Matthew 26. It's a very familiar passage, but there's something in here that's so familiar, it sort of loses its punch, and it, and it must not. It needs to be uh, front and center when we think about our life, when we think about our spiritual growth and what's necessary for that to happen. So we're going to begin in, in chapter 26, verse 26, and, and the heading there says probably the Last Supper. This is where Jesus sat down at the table with 12 disciples, then Judas left to betray him, and there were 11 left, and that's where, who he shared the bread and the cup with. And so verse 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. And the, it goes on. We read this every time we do communion. He took the bread. He broke it. He said, This is my body, which is for you. He took the cup. He says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, do this uh, in remembrance of me. And then in verse 29, he says, I tell you, I speak unto these eleven, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's making this promise, uh, A, that they're going to do this again. B, he won't be with them until this is fulfilled in the kingdom of God, uh, a date that we are... Um, that's set on our calendar as well. If you're a Christian, you'll be there with these 11 disciples, with Jesus, and all believers of all time, no matter what color skin or language or nation they come from, it's going to be the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. There's going to be laughter. There's going to be joy. And uh, you'll see people who have gone home uh, to be with the Lord before you. Uh, it's going to be great. And so here Jesus is making his promise to these 11 disciples. Guys, they must have been feeling, first of all, like, what? Where are you going? And then, well, that might be cool, because when they're, in their mind, the kingdom is an earthly kingdom, where Christ is king of all. Well, verse uh, 30 then, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, that is their, the closing, really, of the Last Supper, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives was just a stone's throw, a long throw, uh, through a valley, the Kidron Valley, and then up over this mound, this hill that overlooked Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples, this was sort of a favorite hangout for them. When Jesus wanted to get away, he'd often go to the Mount of Olives if he was in that area. And so they go to the Mount of Olives, verse 31, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. What? 
I mean, we just had this wonderful meal together. We all just celebrated, you know, uh, the cup and the breaking of bread. There's lots of confusion, but this statement must have really floored them. Like, did he just say what I thought he said? You'll all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So they, again, are not getting what he's saying. Uh, but, but what we do, he, it says that after they have fallen away, what's going to happen? They're going to regather. He's going to meet them in Galilee, which is exactly what happened. Right? He rose from the dead, and he met them at different times over the 40 days before he ascended into heaven. But what he, you see there and what you cannot miss is the fact that Jesus knew they were going to mess up and his commitment to them uh, was not uh, damaged. His commitment to them stood. And his commitment to you, when you stumble, even when you deny, in, in Peter's case, even knowing Jesus, his commitment uh, is not like ours. His is sure and true. In fact, we have John 21, that great chapter where Jesus, the, uh, Peter says, I'm going fishing. He takes seven people with him of the disciples, and they see this guy cooking breakfast on the shore, and he says, cast your net on the other side. They catch a big catch of fish, uh, and this is uh, deja vu for all the disciples, and one of them says, that must be Jesus. And so Peter jumps in the water, swims in, and, and they have this wonderful conversation where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Now this is after his betrayal. And Peter says, yes, I love you. He says, well, feed my sheep. And he asks three times, right? Do you love me? Tend my lamb. Basically, Jesus is saying, get back to work. I said in the 16th chapter of this very book of Matthew, he said, you are Peter, little rock, and on you I'll build my church, Right? And that's what he meant, and that's what happened. But for Peter, he needed a little restoration in his heart. And Jesus took him through that process. This is such a great example of Christ's commitment to you. We're talking about commitment, and we're especially talking about our commitment to him. I'm just saying he's committed to you fully. For one, he died for you. But he's not going to let go. This is, this is great stuff. And, and right here you have an example of his commitment to his guys, to those who, who had declared, we have left everything to follow you. So verse 33, of course, Peter denies it. He says, though uh, they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Luke says, you will deny that you even know me. Verse 35, Peter said, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So everyone was on the same page. Jesus said, You're all going to fall away. And all of them said, No way. Of course, Peter was the loudest, which is no surprise. And so uh, here's, here's my takeaway. First of all, how long had these disciples walked with Jesus? Well, most people believe about three or three and a half years. They didn't all join up at the same time, but about three years. And what did they see from Jesus during those three years? Well, they saw him, first of all, turn water into wine at a wedding. They saw him walk on water. They saw him still the storm. They saw him cast out demons from crazy people. I mean, people that were bleeding, making themselves bleed and cutting themselves. I mean, you name it, Jesus did it. And he said it. I mean, he taught, and they sat under his teaching. At one time, many of his disciples, the people that were following Jesus, left him, and he turns to, his, to, to the twelve, and he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, where we go? We've left everything to follow you. So they were committed to Jesus. I mean, they, they had left everything. They left their nets. Matthew left his tax collecting business. I mean, they, they left everything. And now they're following, would you say, they're committed to Jesus. And yet, it comes to crunch time, and every single one denied him or ran away. 
what is going on here? I believe, just like those disciples, we overestimate our commitment to Jesus, where it is. In other words, we think it's here, but it's actually here. Secondly, I believe we underestimate the power of our flesh. What is our flesh? That is our own desires, our own uh, weaknesses, our own tendency to follow temptation. We, under, uh, we think we're stronger than we are against our own desires. And we think we're here when we're really here. This was true of those disciples. They saw, no way, I'm not going to, this isn't, this isn't me. And so I want us to kind of evaluate, as honestly as we can, our own commitment level. How committed I, am I, really? Um, so no more pretending in our own head. Now, no one's going to see this, but you see on the right-hand column, you can rate yourself from 1 to 7. Just cover it up. Don't let anybody see it. It's just for you, okay? And, and I want to go through seven things, seven ways to know the level of commitment that we have to Jesus. But first, I want to show you a short video. It's one minute long. Some of you know the name Francis Chan. He's one of the best Bible teachers, pastors alive today. And he travels quite a bit, does a lot of speaking. He's an amazing uh, uh, leader. And uh, he tells us a story from when he was 15 years old. Watch this. You might be the most gifted human being on the planet. But God wants to grow us, and especially our commitment to him, and test us, and shape us. And you know how he does that? By cleaning the bathroom, and stacking chairs. No, 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 but I want to preach. I want to teach the Bible. Or you fill in the blank. I want to do this for God. Is fine in a bit. But I have a bathroom for you to clean. And these days, it's like the lights are drawing us so powerfully that this idea of serving Jesus in the trenches, in the non fun kinds of ministries, is, is gone, it's forgotten. And, and I pray that God will send someone who loves you. And says, I have some chairs to stack today. So let's try to measure our commitment here. Number one, am I connected to people who love Jesus? Do you have a good friend who loves the Lord? Who walks with you in your journey? Do you have a group of friends, a small group or a ministry team, somebody, uh, some buddies who, who uh, you can link arms and say, we're here to encourage each other. When you're down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak into you encouragement. And when I'm down, will you come and say the same to me? And that's, that's how God designed it, which is why he calls it the family of God, right? Your brother, your sister. And that's the kind of relationship he desires for us, the kind that's absolutely essential. If we're going to continue to grow, we need each other more than we think. Secondly, so give yourself a number, one to seven, seven being highest. Secondly, a daily time with God. A time, uh, seven days a week or, or five days a week, where you read the Word, you, you take some time to pray, to listen to God. What, what's, on, what's on your agenda for me today? Um, and that might happen several times during the day, but you have a regular or daily time to think, to meditate. Uh, Paul says in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's this right here in God's Word. And, and I promise you, while you might or may learn something on Sunday morning from the teacher, uh, the best teaching comes during the week 
when you open the Bible and you're in a regular reading program or you just <laughs> randomly open it up and say, God, what do you got for me? Guess what? He's got something for you because he says, I want to I teach you something. We have the teacher within us, the Holy Spirit, uh, John writes in 1 John. So, so uh, uh, rate yourself there. A weekly Sabbath. Now, these are, these are commitments. These are practices. These are habits. Now, how do you get in the habit of eating right? Or exercise? Or getting healthy? Don't you have to make some choices that resist the urge of the flesh? I mean, the strongest urge I have in my life right now is after dinner when I sit down and turn on a movie for chips uh, or, or, or dip. Right? It's just, it just yells in my ear. Um, it's in the cupboard. Right? It's waiting. Okay? Now, I don't know what your soft spot is. Okay? But your soft spot has to do with the flesh. That is that, that bad soft spot. Like, you give in too easily. Or, I'm not going to work out today because, you know, it's snowing out. Or whatever. Um, and so a weekly Sabbath is one of those habits, so the, the habit of rest and corporate worship and, 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 and gathering with God's people. Number four, I'm using my gifts in ministry. Uh, this, uh, one of your, the flyers in your bulletin, are, they have the word shape on it, S-H-A-P-E. Uh, S is for what is your spiritual gift. H is what is your heart, what passion has God given to you that just resonates a is for your abilities. All of you have unique and, and powerful abilities. P is your personality. How, does God, how did God wire you, and how does he want to use that personality for his glory and for his church and for the gospel? And E is probably the most important one is uh, your experience, which is where have you felt uh, hurt and pain in your life? God wants to use that in the lives of other people. And so... Um, each, God has shaped each one of you as his followers to have an important part in his body, in his family. And so um, number four is I'm using my gifts in a ministry. Is there a ministry that you have that you're using your gifts in? Number, number five, I live by biblical financial principles. That's also obviously a part of our commitment is... Uh, having to do with finances. I mean, this is what Jesus talked about more than anything else. Um, number six, I stay true to these commitments, even in the face of pain, opposition, and ridicule. Uh, this is the, your level of being battle-tested, right? Um, you've, got, you've, you've gone through some things in your life, and these commitments still stand. They're still uh, um, your commitments, okay? You don't don't waver. Now, all of us have gone through times in our lives and storms where we kind of we kind of were ready to bail out. But um, this, what is your what is your commitment level in terms of being battle tested? Give yourself a number there. And then number seven, with all my heart, I seek to walk in step with His Spirit. This has more to do with the heart. Now, let me just give you an example. It's a little uh, a rudimentary, but I believe. Growing in Christ is like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And if you take the jelly away, what do you got? You got a peanut butter sandwich. Uh, if, you take, if you take the peanut butter away, you have a jelly sandwich. I like the combination of peanut butter and jelly. Well, for the Christian life, the peanut butter is your commitment. The jelly is God's commitment to you, which is primarily his Holy Spirit. He's embedded the third person of the Trinity, God himself, the Holy Spirit. He's a he, not a force, and he's embedded in your life. And it takes both of these, without, one without the other, you will not grow. If you're all spirit, you're all excited one day, and the next day you're down in the dumps. God must have left me. And if you're all commitment, you're like the Pharisees with no heart. You keep the law. You have all these practices. They tithed of the mint leaves that came out of their garden. They gave one leaf to God, 
and kept nine at home. Right? So, so they were uh, hyper committed, but they had no heart. And, of course, Jesus called them out for that very thing. So it's a peanut butter and jelly life. You need commitment. Without it, you won't go anywhere. You won't have any solidity. But commitment alone will never be enough any more than it was with these disciples. Were they committed? Yes. Did they fall? Absolutely. Because your flesh, will, your willpower will never be strong enough for you to be successful in the Christian life. Your willpower will never be enough. It wasn't for these disciples, and they'd walked with Jesus, physically walked with him, seen these miracles. If there's anybody that should have stood, they should have stood, and they didn't. They fell. They all fell away. The flesh, your flesh, however disciplined you are, however you've trained your will, power. And I believe, by the way, I think you can train your will, your spirit, at small s, that all of us have a spirit in us, small s. <clears throat> and we have the Holy Spirit, capital S. But our spirit, our human spirit, um, can be trained, okay? You can train yourself to wake up and not sleep in and miss work. You can train yourself to eat right, to get enough exercise, to have a healthy body. You can do these things. And likewise, in your spiritual walk, you can train yourself uh, to, that, that helps to guarantee that your mind will continue to uh, um, grow and your, your will will grow, your strength. Will. By the way, I think this is why God created fasting. Many people have asked me, why would Jesus fast? What was that all about in the Old Testament? No one fasts today except health nuts. I don't think it was about health at all. Now, it probably had that benefit. I don't know. I think fasting was training the will because your stomach says, I'm hungry, and who's going to be in charge? Your stomach or your commitment? So, so, yes, you can train, but you can never train it enough to prevent you from falling. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak says in verse 41, spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. In, Ch in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, I'm wrestling all the time with this. He says, inside I want to do what's right, but in the end I do what's wrong. I can't help myself. Who will save me from this battle within, this war that wages within me? And he's just speaking for all of us, okay? And he says, thank God for his spirit. And Romans chapter 8 is filled with the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit, which is where I want to go right now. There's five stages of growth in your Christian walk. The first is put a check mark where you, where at each box that applies to you. So I put a check mark at this first one because everyone here is discovering and considering Jesus. I mean, if you, even if you're not a believer, even if you haven't crossed the threshold and said, I do, to Jesus, you're still here. And so something about Jesus, something about his church family um, was interesting to you. So all of us have come to this place where we have said, we've learned about Jesus, and we go, wow, this is cool. Some here, most here, have stepped over the threshold and said, I do. I, I invite you into my life, Jesus. And I want, to, I want to surrender to you. I want to give my heart to you. I want to, I want to let you know that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And we come on our knees, so to speak, before the Lord. And that's step two, that we make a, a decision, which is really the starting point um, for a life of surrender and peace. Number three, you commit to this new life. You, you make certain um, uh, choices. You say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean up my mouth. I'm going to stop gossiping. I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to talk to God, and I'm going to actually listen to Him, and I'm going to start, I'm going to get baptized. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change some of my ways, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change somewhat who I hang out with. Okay? And who I surround myself. All of these things are part of this uh, middle step of commitment. I'm going to make this commitment morally, you know, spiritually, 
uh, intellectually um, and, and hope that it, uh, it, it uh, uh, filter or, or spills out into my whole life. Um, and then number four, a stage that some of you, perhaps most of you, have been through. You've fought through discouragement, frustration, and failure. Um, the most righteous man in the world, God said, was a man named Job. And he went through some real trials, some serious trials, right? And, and, and so he was tested. In fact, testing is your best friend, according to James. Consider it all joy, be thrilled when you uh, undergo certain trials because the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result, lacking in nothing. He says the best, your best friend in your spiritual life and in life in general is when God tests your faith. It's the tree that grows on the mountainside and is subject to the winds and the storms that is the strongest as opposed to the tree that's grown in a greenhouse. Right? It's that testing that builds its fiber and makes it such a strong, uh, impervious kind of um, tree. And so that's the same it is with us. God uses these trials in our lives. So, so just check all the ones that apply to you. And before I get to the fifth one, I want to show you a scripture. This is Philippians chapter 2. When I first uh, um, saw this, in the way that I'm going to describe, it was, it was kind of a paradox and very intriguing. So I want to, this is Philippians 2, chapter 12. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It says, work out your own salvation. What does that mean? Work out. Now, if you go work out this afternoon, it has to do with physical exercise. But spiritually, what would it be to work out your salvation? I thought I was already saved. Well, if you committed your life to Christ, you are saved. But you're saved from your sin, but you're not fully saved from yourself, from your past, from some of those past demons, from, from uh, that, that uh, um, anger, for some of you, or anxiety. So there's still things that he says, I want you to work out your salvation. Grow in your commitment to me and let me produce in you the fruit that you've always wanted. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. He says, these things come from my spirit. But you're going to have to work. You're going to have to wrestle. You're going to have to scratch and claw. He says, work out your salvation. Now, one day, this battle will be over. Can I hear a praise God? Because <laughs> when Christ comes back or when I die, the battle is over, and I will realize the full, the full measure of God's salvation. I will be free from this body of death as Romans, uh, Paul says in Romans 7. Who will free me from this struggle that I have with my flesh that is so weak and always fails? Well, one day, praise God. Heaven isn't just we're going to be with God. We're going to be everything that we were ever created to be without any of the problems. Okay, so anyway, this is verse 12. Work out your salvation. And then he says in verse 13, For it is God who works in you. Well, I thought I was supposed to work. You are. Well, this says God is working on you. Peanut butter and jelly. Huh? It's my part, my commitment, but his commitment to me. Now, what does God do when he works in you? He says he'll work in you both to will or want to. He'll give you the desire. You are here today, hopefully, because you desire to see God take over more of your life to give you all that he's promised. So he says, both to will and to work, to do the work for his good pleasure. In the end, it is to please God. So you have both of these, the peanut butter and the jelly. He says, work out your salvation. Break a sweat. Work at it. But he says, by the way, God's working with you. 
He's working in you, and he's bringing about changes if you'll let him. And this was the part the Pharisees did not get. So number five is simply this, a walk of faith in step with his Holy Spirit. This is the final step that will take you from this day to the end of your life. This is the th now the struggle. If these other things are true, then what God says is, let me lead you step by step. How does he do that? By his spirit, his voice, his uh, promptings, his, uh, his putting, him putting his desire in me for that which is right. Uh, God is the one who embeds in us a dream, a dream for our life, a dream for using our gifts, etc. It's God who's at work in you, and he does that through his Holy Spirit, which is exactly the way he used the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. Now, we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father directed Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God who was in Jesus, and he says, now I want to do, and Jesus said to his disciples, to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit, and you can't have what I have, which is constant, 24-7, voice of God in my heart. Okay, and so that's what God has given the possibility for all of us. So I want us to close with this verse. Look at the end of your notes, Galatians 5, 16 through 25. This is a, this is a absolute uh, bedrock verse or passage or s section of scripture that you must understand. Okay, so don't don't let me don't don't uh, don't go to sleep on me. Here it is, Galatians five sixteen. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the flesh. Remember, we said the flesh we're are, we're never strong enough in the flesh to resist entirely. Uh, what we need to resist. We, we, can, we can grow our willpower, but only to a certain point it will never be good enough to give us victory in Jesus. But if we walk by the Spirit, he says, uh, it's different. The Spirit can produce fruit in our lives. He says in verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It's not about keeping the law and checking off this and that. In verse 22, he says, the fruit of the Spirit, which I quoted earlier, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, all these, and that's just representative of all the great things that God will do in our heart and in our life. Wouldn't it be great to have the peace of God, especially today? I mean, everybody seems anxious about everything. And he says, I will give you my peace. Not that the world gives you, right? Counselor can't give you this. Your spouse can't give you this. Your kids can't give you this. They certainly can't. Okay, your parents can't give you this. Only God can give us peace. And he says it's just a natural byproduct of, my, uh, of walking by the Spirit. So that sounds weird to me. So let's keep going. Verse 25. If you live by the Spirit, also walk by the Spirit. Now the word walk here is repeated a couple times. In verse 16, the word walk is in Greek peripateo, which is about, used about 100 times. Okay? And it's what you might expect, walk. I'm walking along, I'm counting my steps, uh, there's someone with me called the Holy Spirit, and we're walking together. When you walk by the Spirit, it's like you're walking with Him. It's like, it's like every day the Spirit is there, and we're walking together. Okay. Now I've said many times, I'll say it again, I believe that Adam and Eve walked with God every day in the Garden of Eden. And one day after they sinned, He came again at His regular time, and in the cool of the day, and he said, Adam, where are you? They didn't show up. Why? Because they had sinned, and they were embarrassed, and they were ashamed. And sin had its way with them. And, and yet, before that, every day they'd take this walk. They walked with the Lord. We use that same uh, uh, terms today. We walk with the Lord. And he says, walk by the Spirit. What if every day you took a walk with the Spirit? Well, you do, because he's walking with you. Okay? matter of fact, but are you listening? Are you talking? Are you praying? Are you in this conversation that never ends? 
uh, when you get up in the morning, what do you got for me today, Lord? And you look in his word, and when you open his word, he, he's very clear. He says, Bruce, you're messing up, you stupid guy. Why would you teach your wife that way? You know, or whatever he says. Or he could say, Bruce, I just want to encourage you today. I've gifted you for exactly what I got for you on the, on the schedule today. Okay, or whatever he says. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm walking with the Lord. And he's producing in me, um, at first unseen, the fruit of the Spirit. And so, you know, like, wow, a couple of years ago, that would have just knocked me off um, uh, the path. But not today. Not today. What's the difference? I've been walking with the Spirit. So that's the word walk. In verse uh, 25, it says, live by the Spirit. Same kind of idea. Uh, Well, also, if you live by the Spirit, God's Spirit is in you. But I want you to walk by the Spirit. In the NIV, it says walk in step with the Spirit. And the reason is because the word walk there is a different word. It's stoikos. It's only used five times in the New Testament. And it's the idea of walking in line. Actually, it's used in some cases as marching. That is uh, the idea of cadence. But it's also the idea of walking in step. So if the Spirit was right here and he was walking, I would... You know, it's like the three-legged race. It's like I'm, I'm walking right in step with him. I'm not going ahead of him. I'm not going behind him. I'm just uh, trusting. I'm relying. I'm in step with him. And he says, walk in step with the Spirit. Don't get ahead. Don't get anxious. Don't make a stupid decision. Listen, right? Um, and let me guide you. And all of this to say, it, it's impossible to will yourself to grow spiritually, if that's all it is. But willpower, as it is trained in the, in the presence of and the pace of the Holy Spirit, will change your life. It'll change your life. Keep these two together. Commitment and sensitivity and responsiveness to the Spirit's voice. Now, I don't want to get all voodoo on you, because sometimes it's silent. Lord, what are you saying? Crickets. Sometimes I think he's silent for whatever reason. Maybe he's, that's part of the test. I don't know. And other times, it's just as clear as can be. There's been a few times in my life where I absolutely knew God was speaking to me. There wasn't an audible voice, but he was directing. Okay? And that will be true for you as you walk in the Spirit. Okay? Uh, again, I don't, wanna, I don't want this to sound all mystical, but it is a mystery. It's for real. God lives in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he says to you what Jesus tells him to say. John 16. Are you listening? Are you even prepared? Are you committed? All of these things come together, and I promise you, your life will never be the same again. You will hear his voice. You will follow his direction. And one day you'll wake up and realize, I'm in the middle of his purpose for me. That's a great place to be, by the way. This is who God made me to be. And it wasn't orchestrated by me, although I cooperated. So I want to close in prayer. I want to pray words that I hope you pray with me. Okay? So let's bow in prayer. Lord... We come to you as those first disciples. We, uh, we tend to overestimate our willpower, but in fact, we're weak. The flesh is weak. Lord, I, I thank you that you're faithful to us even when we stumble as those first disciples did. I thank you that you walk beside us even when we're stubborn and when we're rebellious and we pretend that you're not there. 
Forgive us, Lord. And now as we move forward in this day, from now till the end of our lives, Lord, would you teach us to walk in step with you? Train our ears to hear your voice, to know it as the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Give us faith to step where you direct so that if it's a challenge or if it's scary, you'll give us faith to do just that. And Lord, for, for all of us here, I pray as we walk in step with you, that you'll make clear, you'll make evident, that you will, we will be able to say, wow, this is how it should be. And that you'll develop a pattern in our lives such that every day becomes like that. I pray for us here in this room and those watching online that, God, you would begin to change not only our lives, but we would be able to infect or affect those around us, and they will see a person of peace and joy and love. And that you will speak to us your forgiveness and your encouragement as we stumble along. Help us to fail forward into your hands. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus and according to your word that we have looked at today. Amen.